Welcome to Forum at 360. I'm Jeremy Shea. Today, we're joined by four artists from around the country who are touring Ketchikan, Juno, Gustavus, and Sitka by ferry. Each artist has prepared a short presentation to share their work and ideas. They're exploring the theme of signal to noise and their understanding of place, nature, and community. Our guests today are Nina Elder, who examines historic land use and its cycles of pr production, consumption, and waste through her drawings and paintings. She lives in New Mexico. Jimmy Reardon, his projects have involved earth building, augmented reality, letterpress, and translation, among others. Reardon splits his time between Alaska and Pennsylvania. Wendy Given, she creates vivid, uncanny contemporary photography, sculpture, drawing, and installation. She says it's guided by nature, myth, and magic. And Given lives in Portland, Oregon. And toward the end, Billy Joe Miller. Billy Joe creates mixed media works that are immersive and multi-sensory. His structures, shapes, light, and sounds frame and create contemplative, site-responsive spaces. He also lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And finally, the artist's Tideline's Journey is sponsored by the Island Institute based in Sitka. Peter Bradley is the executive director of the Institute, traveling with the artists. Peter, welcome back to Forum at 360. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Peter, this is the second year the Island Institute has put together this floating residency. Uh, how does it fit with the organization's mission? Thank you. Um, uh, the, the Tideline's journey was, was built out of a desire to, to create a program uh, that could only happen in Southeast and that would give um, a group of artists a chance to, to enter into a, a, an inquisitive framework um, uh, while traveling together uh, and learning from Southeast Alaskan communities and, uh, and while, while being inspired by the coastline. Um, we have this incredible resource in the Alaska Marine Highway, and so it seemed like a, a great opportunity to build a nomadic residency program that, could, uh, that we could use to spark dialogues that, um, uh, among the artists and within the communities um, that help speak to how we live together uh, as, as, uh, within human communities and also within broader natural communities. And so the Island Institute's work is about fostering a language of place and community. And, and so this program is, is uh, sort of bringing together a few different approaches to, to doing that. And so in each community, the artists present their work, but so do local people. And then from all of that inspiration and in the context of the theme that we select, um, we host uh, dialogues. Um, that, and so that's, that's sort of the, the format along the way. We also visit schools and Okay. Well, uh, so Peter, I, could you set us up for our first artist's presentation? Sure. Nina Elder is from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, Nina um, does immersive traveling research projects that investigate uh, industrial landscapes, human affected landscapes, um, uh, reminding us of, of what we leave behind as we go about our business. Okay. Great. Take it away, Nina. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. and. Um, with this amazing group of people in such an incredible place. So I'm going to be showing some images. Um, so all of my work, it focuses on the remnant of, of land use and how, well, how what we use in the world affects the natural environment. And I primarily focus on piles of things and holes in the ground. Um, this began with an investigation of trash cycles in California. Maybe it didn't begin there. This was part of the investigation. And I like to show this painting because it was the beginning of what I've always thought of as a research-based practice. This pile of metal was outside of my studio in San Francisco. And I would see this pile grow and shrink throughout the years. And um, in the course of making this painting, learned that there's a $1.8 billion trash trade between California and China um, that often utilizes Bangladeshi labor and a lot of unscrutinized environmental practices. So I realized in the course of making a painting or a drawing, I can learn a lot and help share the information that I've gained that maybe isn't readily available. Um, and that led me to an interest in something that's so often overlooked, but to me is the most, the greatest icon of humans, and that is piles of rock. So I'm acutely aware of after the research that I've done, that everything we use comes from the earth. It's either grown or mined, every single thing on this planet. Um, and so in those, 
in extracting those elements from nature. We're leaving behind piles. And it's a long interest of mine. I've made work about it for a long time period. So all of the images that I work from are from mines that I have hiked and backpacked into and um, photographed, tried to learn a little bit about the history of it. I look at maps, mining documents, historic documents. And these drawings are made using materials that I gather from the sites and I'm burnishing the drawings with them. So there's always an element of place and of experience embedded within my drawings. And to me, it's really important to recognize that these are everywhere. And once I've started seeing piles of rocks, I see them everywhere. And that we have a huge economy based on everything that we're taking out of the ground, but also the movement of those materials. So I was recently in Vancouver, and they were selling their gravel to Los Angeles to build freeways. And a gravel, I found out a gravel pit near Los Angeles was selling their gravel to British Columbia um, to do some dam infilling. And it just seemed interesting that there's this economy of trade when there's a lot of resources on hand. So that we're um, seeing the movement of rocks being pretty iconic um, of our economy. This is a recent drawing. Um, I'm also looking at uranium mining and uranium storage. And I like to play with the perception of um, toxicity in my work. So um, the title of this work is Unprocessed Uranium. So a lot of people mistake that as the material because it glows yellow. Um, so in thinking about human impacted landscapes and living in New Mexico, I've had a long interest in the nuclear legacy and uh, the growth of atomic weaponry and atomic en energy. Um, so I started drawing uh, classified images from early in the atomic legacy. So this is a drawing of the first atomic device uh, moments before it was exploded. And I use radioactive charcoal to make this work. So I travel to atomic test areas around um, New Mexico, gather materials, and make these works based on historic photographs that I collect. This is the first atomic detonator being pulled out into the desert um, before it was exploded. And um, this is a Triton International Missile uh, silo being dug in an undisclosed location. So an interesting part of my practice is that I'm really curious about what we're allowed to see and what we're not allowed to see. So in working with classified images, I'm exploring that and pushing that a little bit. Um, I'll snap a photo of, a, of an image in a museum, or I will ask an archivist to share something with me. So it's a lot about travel and relationships and seeing what I can see and what I can learn from what we're not supposed to see. So that really relates to the signal to noise to me. We have um, the things that we're supposed to look at in the landscape, and I'm determined to take some of the camouflage away and see what we're not supposed to see. This is the Sedan Crater at the Nevada nuclear test site. I waited on a two year long um, security clearance wait list to be able to visit this site. And um, this was an earth moving endeavor. They were thinking about digging the next Panama Canal using um, nuclear explosives, but this, this test proved that it was a very bad idea, but it left the largest man-made hole on the planet. Um, so my interest in, in holes and piles is what first brought me to Alaska four years ago. A dear friend of mine said, you have to go to Kennecott, Alaska. There's more piles of rocks there than anywhere you've ever seen. So what's interesting about Kennecott is it's the sign of a major historic mine, but it's also the site of two glaciers converging and receding. So you have man-made mining detritus piles and you have glacial moraines and they're mingling together and cr crashing up against each other in one um, place that's also astoundingly beauty, beautiful and has amazing people. Um, so I have to show images of this to people that don't know Alaska, as probably most of your audience do, and say, this is an image of a glacier. They look at it and they just see piles of dirt. And there's this perception that all glaciers look like your Mendenhall Glacier, the blue icy edge, but they're actually rocky um, places. So what interests me most about the Kennecott mine um, is that it really, to me, is the birthplace of our contemporary economy in North America. And um, Alaska and Canada are so important to that economy and that so much of that is often overlooked. I think the North is often um, not given the recognition it deserves for how um, much of its land is sacrificed for economic growth. Um, so this is an image of a tram car uh, that goes up to the mine at the Kennecott Mines. and. Um, you know, through my research, I've learned $300 billion worth of copper came out of these mines. 
and that became the J.P. Morgan wealth and the Guggenheim wealth. Um, so obviously very important to the U.S. economy. People say we wouldn't have uh, plumbing or the electric grid to the extent that we have it today without these mines. And what blows my mind is that the environmental impact of this mine in Alaska is so small. These are this amount of copper was taken out of pretty small holes in the ground, very low environmental impact, but huge impact on the economy. Mm -hmm. So what that led to um, is when you have an immense amount of money, you have to reinvest it into things. This is an image of me backpacking into one of the sites. So um, oh, here's another example of that the mines really do not have a huge environmental impact. These are still the old mine houses perched on the edge of a cliff above Kennecott, Alaska. Um, and to me, it's very interesting that these mines are in these beautiful natural places and that they are continuing. The geologic time is still more important. They haven't interrupted geologic time, like the, the scale of mining that I'm about to show. Um, so the Kennecott Corporation, with that immense amount of money that they had from that original mine, now is one of the largest parent companies of mining on the whole planet. They're worth about $128 billion a year. They have over a thousand subsidiaries. They have mining operations on nearly every continent. And so now I'm endeavoring, because of my love of this certain place in Alaska, to recreate in graphite and in mining ore that I've collected from the mine in Alaska, images of their mines around the world. So this is an image of one of their copper mines in Utah. The drawing itself is um, about five feet by five feet. And um, I've made quite a few of these. They, their mines range from Peru to China, Silver City, New Mexico. They're one of the major mines is pretty much in my backyard. Um, this is a coal mine in China. So you can see the extent of this one mine in Alaska and its impact across the world and how vastly important it is. This is a mine that they own in Indonesia. And most of these places are really impossible to access. So we're all using um, elements from these mines every day in our cell phones, in the cameras that are filming me right now, in the cars we drive. Every single thing we use is completely dependent on the Kennecott Corporation, mm -hmm. yet so few people have access to these places or are able to look at them. So in drawing them, I'm hoping to illuminate them, amplify that story, shine a light on the environmental issues, the human rights issues, the scale of engineering that allows our daily life to exist. So going to a different scale, my interest in mining has led me very much to look at the individual human endeavors of mining. And I think there's a lot of interesting similarities between early prospectors and artists. I imagine prospectors going out with a shovel, searching for months and years and sometimes decades for this one glimmer, this thing that they hope is valuable and that they can take take to the bank and that other people will invest in and it'll change their life, it'll change everyone else's lives. And I think that as artists we're often doing that. We're searching for the one glimmer and we want to then take that with us and show it to people and have people you know, invest in it or say that they love it and have it change maybe us, maybe the world. Um, so I've continued to look at hand dug mine shafts and make drawings of those. I'm collecting images of historic photographs of hands holding what I call the bonanza stone. This moment when you've dug up a piece of ore and you take it to the bank and, and the miner would say, please value this, please invest in me. And I have these gold nuggets to prove it, please back my endeavor. And it often would work and then they would go back and become an overnight millionaire but they would have been searching for years and years and years. Um, so I'm very interested in this moment when the stone goes from being this dirty lump of soil to something that's valuable. And some of these Bonanza stones, you know, with the Kennecott Corporation, that was a $300 billion moment when they first realized how much copper was in that mountain. So I was lucky enough to do a residency with the Tamarind Institute in Albuquerque and make a series of lithographs from these images recently. Um, it was very interesting drawing. Lithography is a stone-based medium. You're drawing on stone and printing from stone. So the entire project was about the value of these stones. So um, these are some very interesting pieces of war to me in lithography format. So back to Alaska. Um, my father worked for the military when I was a kid and wasn't able to tell me very much about where he was. Later in life, I learned he was the decommissioning officer for the Dew Line, which um, 
is much more common knowledge in Alaska than where I'm from in Colorado and New Mexico, but it's the distant early warning system. It's a series of radars that bounce information from um, the northern boundaries with Russia down to NORAD in my hometown of Colorado Springs. So um, when I was about the age that I'm seeing in that photograph, my dad was up here um, uh, figuring out which of these military sites should stay active and which should be decommissioned. And so I've been collecting historic photographs of these radar sites. Um, and I also have been really lucky to travel to some of them. There's this uh, Cold War mentality of not telling stories, of not describing where things are. It's a government approved mentality. There's a secrecy and a silence to it. And I'm very curious now what I can do um, to create a sensory landscape uh, around my father's silence. So he was in these incredible places, off, often on native Alaskan land, and wasn't able to share any of those stories. So I am traveling to many of them, visiting them, meeting the people that worked there, that still live there. This is me on a four-wheeler up on the Bering Strait last summer, going into one of them. I have a great love of adventure. Uh, here's me waving at Russia across the Bering Strait from one of our uh, abandoned mostly abandoned military sites. Um, and then I'm making drawings from these as well. So to me, there's this incredible uh, sense of volume of information that was lost. And some of that is personal information, but some of it is the information that our military was hoping to get. This radar system had a one billion billionth accuracy from each radar bounce, and it was a system of 53 radars, so it was really ineffective. So I'm, I like thinking about all of that leftover information still bouncing around in the troposphere because the way the signals were bouncing around, they, they might still exist. So I'm, the most recent work I've been making, I've been based in the Pacific Northwest this fall and winter, and unlike my home in Albuquerque, there's the huge timber industry and I've been very curious about the presence of the beauty strip in Oregon and Washington that you can drive down the road and you see these beautiful forests. And the moment you go behind the beauty strip, you see these massive piles of timber. So I've been hiking through the clear cuts and collecting materials from pulp mills and making these large scale charcoal drawings with the burnt off pulp from those pulp mills. So these are four foot by six foot drawings that are all very recent and I'm wondering as we move farther north on this trip, uh, as the timber gets smaller, how I will continue to relate to this uh, body of work that I'm in right now. So I will pass this off to okay. Jimmy Ryan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank yeah. You. All right, so I'm gonna go up here. So I've decided to do a little bit of reading from a project that I did a number of years back. Um, when thinking about the theme signal to noise in my own work, it's, I've found that it kind of pops up all over the place in many, many different projects, as I think we've found that it seems to pop up in different sort of metaphoric ways in the experiences of a lot of the people we've been visiting with. And so one of the projects that is sort of dearest to me is one that I started in 2007, 2008, so about a decade ago, if you count 2007, um, where um, without knowing French, I translated the turn-of-the-century French novel Le Roman de Lièvre by Francis Jem. It's the story of a hare and an, a group of animals that meet St. Francis of Assisi, and um, under his guidance, they travel to heaven and get to visit the various heavens or paradises of beasts. And I knew, sort of as we started this trip, I knew deep down that there was something about this signal and noise, like... Um, that related to it. And then over the last couple of days, I kind of had that aha moment. Because when the author, when Jem describes the various paradises of beasts or the various heavens, um, he does it in a sort of peculiar way. You know, we're often told about heaven as this place where um, everything is wonderful and there's like no suffering, there's um, no work, there's you know, no lust or hunger, right? Um, there's this idyllic, like, I mean, I, even jokingly, maybe like angels playing badminton and like <laughs> recreating and drinking iced tea. And for Jem, this book is, or at least as I understand it, sort of narrative that I pull from it, is that he sees that as sort of a boring place to be. You know, he takes a lot of joy in, um, he was from the sort of Pyrenees area of France. So he takes a lot of joy in the countryside and in rural living 
And he sort of imagines these animals that also would take joy in um, their um, environment. And so as he describes these paradises, um, he describes these places where these animals sort of do whatever task or whatever um, job it is that they did in life endlessly, right? Um, and so in describing humans, if a carpenters do carpentry for the rest of eternity in their carpentry shops, right? Um, and it was that idea of like finding, you know, you find this purpose or you find this um, task and you learn to love it and it learns to become you. Um, and so to bring that back to signal and noise, I started to think about how for me at least, it's so difficult to figure out what that might be, that idea of like a singular path or a singular um, dedication, right? There's like so many influences, there's so many potential avenues to take, so many different jobs. I mean, the number of jobs I've had, I can't count on my hands and feet, you know? Um, so in any case, that's where it kind of came to me, is like, oh, that idea of like, how do you um, clear away the noise and find that signal that is sort of, um, that craft possibly that you'd like to dedicate yourself to. So what I would like to do, I'm gonna read two of the heavens. I'm gonna read to you where dogs go when they die, and then I'll tell you where wolves go when they die. And just, I'm, I'll probably repeat this part, but when I get to the wolves, you have to understand that this book, it's the opening line is, in the time and the dew of Jean de La Fontaine, Hare heard the hounds. And so by that, in the time and the dew of Jean de La Fontaine, he's framing the whole thing in Fontaine's fables. And those are sort of like tortoise and hare and these animal fables where each of the various animals have a very specific um, character, right? Like the hare is a trickster. You know, the wolf is always just like in wait to kill something. Um, it's always villainous. It's not like the wolf that maybe we think about in Alaska. So I'll probably repeat that. But when I talk about wolf heaven, don't think that, yeah. Anyway, here we go. So, at last they came to the blessed realm of the beasts. The first paradise was that of the dogs. For some time they had heard barking. Then, while looking at the trunk of a worm-eaten oak, they saw a mastiff sitting within a barrel as though it were his kennel. They understood from his dismissive and placid looks that he was not all there. For he was the dog of Dionysus, to whom God had given solitude within this barrow, hollowed out of that very same tree. He gave an indifferent look towards the approaching dogs with their spiked collars. Then, their, to, their, or, then to their astonishment, he left his moss-covered kennel, his leash having become loosened. He went to retie it with his mouth. As he returned to his den of wood, he said, here you must take your pleasure where you find it. And this was their impression. Hare and his companions saw dogs searching for imaginary lost travelers. These dogs went so far as to descend to the bottom of the deepest chasm in search of them, bringing bullion, meat, and brandy contained within small casks suspended from their collars. Others threw themselves into freezing lakes, hoping to withdraw some shipwrecked man, but they were always disappointed. When they regained their footing on the shore, they would stand shivering and stunned, yet satisfied by their pointless devotion. They were ready to dive in once more. Others begged tenaciously for some old bone at the threshold um, of deserted cottages along the road, awaiting kicks, and all of this gave their eyes an inexpressibly adorable melancholy. There was a grinder's dog who joyfully turned the wheel of the grinding stone, his tongue hanging even though there was no knife to be sharpened but his eyes still radiated with the, an unquestioning faith in duty fulfilled. And he would not stop except to catch his breath before returning to his labor once more. There was a labret who, with this same faith, sought to herd a fold of sheep who, sta who strayed for eternity. He pursued them along the banks of the brook which shone on the edge of a grassy hill. From this grassy hill and out from under a wood, a pack of hounds bore forth, having all day hunted the hinds and gazelles of their dreams. Their voices, which lingered among these ancient tracks, sounded the fortunate bells of flowery Easter morning. It was not far from here that the dogs, including the spaniel, 
made their homes. But when the latter tried to bid Hare a tender farewell, she saw that her long-eared friend had run away upon hearing the hunting dogs. So it was without Hare that the sparrowhawk, the owl, the doves, the wolf, and the sheep continued flying or walking respectively. They understood well that he, a hare of little faith, that had not known how to die like them, would rather than be saved by God, prefer to save himself. So what they're getting at there is all the animals while following St. Francis of Assisi um, were asked, as winter was approaching, they were asked like, if they would stay with him and probably perish due to lack of food or if they wanted to go back to their respective homes. And all of, all of them agreed to stay with St. Francis. Um, when Hare agreed, he explained that he wasn't really worried about it. He could eat the bark of the trees. He was resourceful. He wouldn't die. So all the animals passed except for the hare, and he was chosen to be the one to lead them into heaven for some reason. So it's this living hare leading them in. Um, so I'm going to move on to the wolf. Um, and then, again, this is the wolf of Jean de La Fontaine's fables. This is not the wolf um, as we know it. The fourth paradise, or sorry, the fourth paradise in its almost indescribable barrenness was that of the wolves. At the summit of an infertile mountain, in the desolation of the wind, beneath a penetrating fog, these wolves felt the sensual pleasure of martyrdom. They were sustained by their hunger. They, are, they experienced a bitter joy in feeling as though they had been forsaken, that never for more than an instant, and then thanks only to the greatest suffering, had they been able to abdicate their lust for blood. They were outcast, full of dreams never to be realized. It had been a long time since they had been able to approach the celestial lambs, their white lashes fluttering in the green light. And since none of these animals ever died, the wolves could no longer watch for the shepherds throwing their corpses into the laughter of the eternal torrent. The wolves had resigned. Their pelts, hairless as the rock, were pitiable. A sort of miserable grandeur um, reigned in their strange sojourn. One might feel inspired to kiss the forehead of one of these poor carnivores, their destitution so tragic and grave, even at the risk of startling it in the act of slaying a lamb. The beauty of this paradise in which this friend of Francis's took his seat was one of dereliction and despair without hope. And beyond this region, the heavens of the beasts stretched on to infinity. Anyway. That's that. Thank you. Here it is. Thank you very much. Next up, we've got uh, Wendy Given. Wendy Given is a, a photographer and sculptor and mixed media visual artist from. Uh, Portland, also the curator at the Portland International Airport, uh, and Wendy's work is um, eth ethereal and uh, and magical and uh, and 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 full of uh, sort of natural beauty and whimsy. Thank you, and it's humorous too. It's and not humorous. all serious <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so I'll start here. This is the body of work that kind of led me into my larger practice that has kind of been on a running theme for about nine years now. And um, when I was a child, my older sister and I, we were kind of naughty. And my mother is from the Netherlands, so she's first generation Dutch. And um, my mother and my Oma, my grandmother, when we were being naughty, they would give us whole peanuts just a bag of whole peanuts and say, make yourself useful, find some elves. So anybody can do this. The next time, if you like peanuts, if you're not allergic to peanuts, you have a whole peanut shell. And when you separate the two halves of the peanut, the actual pod, you can find peanut elves inside. So these are actual peanut elves that were photographed with a macro lens. And these are salted peanuts, the sort of white that you see is the salt from the, however they salt peanuts. <laughs> so they all kind of have unique personalities and uh, distinctions. Um, that looks like there was a blank there. Um, so with the peanut elves, the A. hypogea albus, I tried to give it a sort of scientific name where uh, the hypogea is the peanut and the albus is actually the elf. So kind of faux science and 
kind of a taxonomy of, of species. So it was a fun project. Um, and then this kind of in the same vein, these I'm really interested in myth and magic and nature and storytelling and uh, just how folklore around the world coincides and how stories are so similar from different cultures and different. So I'm not trying to illustrate necessarily. Um, well, some are more specific than others, but tales and folklore that I think are embedded and very um, interesting correlations between nature and our societies. Um, so this is where the tooth fairy lives. So, and this is how she gets to children's bedrooms. You know, hopefully there's a way to get in if there's a window open, because I think sometimes children don't actually get money and maybe that's why her, her uh, transportation can't get in the house. So in her lair there, there's, you see mounds of teeth and there's actually coins there that she disperses for the children for their teeth. Um, I'm really interested in just images that aren't, they are of environments. A lot of them are constructed environments where I bring in props and things. And sometimes the illusion is more because this, the camera that was used is a really cheap camera and it just happened to make a really great image of a lunar eclipse. And it almost looks like a miniature um, set. So a lot of, I, I bring all these props into the woods. I really like uh, photographing at night. Uh, this is Ignis Fatuus, which is kind of the story of Will of the Wisp, where a little glowing light leads you further and further into the woods until you're lost and then never seen again. So kind of folklore and maybe warnings, you know, why not to go into nature by yourself. Um, Chrysalis, it's um, kind of talking about the cycle of life and death or maybe just sleep. It's like it could be one or the other and sort of the, the mushrooms and the sort of uh, iconic red cloaked woman in the forest is a really interesting sort of phenomenon that seems to happen in literature and especially children's books. Um, these are part of a series of mushroom cubes that were live specimens embedded in resin and they're um, six-sided cubes and you can see from top to bottom they're actually quite small they're only three by three inches but I thought it was a kind of interesting evoking the magic embedded in mushrooms and how transformations happen so in the end they oh that last slide wasn't there. Sorry, they kind of line all up and they make a really beautiful sort of specimen shelf when they're lit so you can see the different species. Some are actually poisonous, some are not. Um, let's see. So a lot of images relating to nature and magic. A lot of my work starts with the words and the title where I've been researching subjects and kind of drawing uh, certain things from literature or just seeing and looking. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's of the Gilly Dew, which is sort of a Scottish-Irish folkloric forest man. And these ghillie suits, that was the most interesting aspect of it. A ghillie suit is kind of military or hunting camouflage. And anybody can buy these. There's snow suits. There's sand suits, there's uh, forest suits, and uh, I thought it would make an interesting image to have these forest people because the ghillie dew was based in folklore of this man that would come, and he was a very mossy man, he'd come out of the woods, so the ghillie dew and the ghillie suit are kind of connected. Um, Shakespeare, um, at Mary Wander of the Night, I've always loved that, uh, from Midsummer's Night Dream. And this was actually in the snow, but this photograph, it doesn't translate very well as a flat image because the snowflakes are actually embedded with uh, Swarovski crystals. So when you see the actual thing, it looks as though it's glittering and when fresh snow falls at night, how beautiful that is. This 
piece was about a, a Slavic and Eastern folkloric witch called Baba Yaga. And I always thought what she says or what the, she steals children. That get that wander into the woods, and she'll she'll confiscate children and eventually eat them. Um, so this is what when you lose a child into the woods, you go and you find her cabin, and it has no windows or doors. But when you say this magic phrase, "Turn your back to the forest, your front to me," a door will appear, and then you can try to barter with her to to have your child returned. I think they're just fun, interesting stories. Dark, I'm interested in the dark, but it's humorous as well. Um, this was <laughs> one, this is a funny story more than, it's sort of a performative image. I, that's me, and I was jumping off of that stump several hundred times to get the right shot of myself up in the air, and this was the only one that actually worked out. And shortly after that, I sprained my ankle, like really bad. Not actually jumping off the stump, but walking back to the, the residency that I was at at the time. So, And uh, this is just a play on the landscape, kind of based on the boat of Charon, which is a uh, translation or, or relation to the river Styx. And I thought, to how can this image become an interesting sort of representation of parallel worlds or moving into another place? So the water is actually flipped with the sky in this image. And you can sort of see bubbles in the top in the water a little bit, but the water was perfectly still. And I had a friend go out in that canoe and actually lay down. And he's like, can you see me now? And it's like, no, get all the way down in the bottom. Because yeah, I had to get the boat back. So it's pretty fun. And this was sort of a homage to uh, Duchamp and his last piece. I won't say the French title because I'll, bur I'll butcher the, the name. But it, it's, um, it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art now. and it's. It's called the Waterfall. Oh gosh, I should know this. Um, but it was based on that, where Duchamp has this little peephole, and you look in a wooden wall, and it's actually his girlfriend that's laid out in the glass, and she has a fire, a flickering like candlelight. It's a beautiful, beautiful, really big three-dimensional piece. So I have a taxidermied hair in this sort of homage of it and inside there's a whole forest scape where you peep through and it's a diorama box so when you look the coolest thing about it was when it was in this installation the floor was vibrating just a little bit so it looked like the trees were the leaves and the trees were blowing so kind of fun and this is a it's an 11 foot tall sculpture and there's an old gypsy curse uh, which is the title of this piece. And it's, I guess, when you're out to get someone, you say, may you get what you want and want what you get. So this was kind of a play on that of this unattain unattainable wishing well, where you can't actually make a wish because it's so tall up. And it's actually illuminated from within. So there's crystals laid on the top. That's why there's a little, um, so it really kind of sparkles like there's water inside. And then I started working with uh, antique Black Forest cuckoo clocks and making diorama boxes within, them, within the clocks to sort of represent the cuckoo that works in the clock and what he does when he's not chiming. And this one, I thought he had a little glass of wine and his reading material, and he had gone to bed. And there's actually a tiny working cuckoo clock inside of his little chamber. It's called cubiculum. So it's like a um, turn of the century sleeping chamber. So you, you can actually look inside of the clock and see the actual time when you want to see what time it is. And this is called Wraith. It's actually a, a large uh, tall sail model ship that I put together. And um, it's permanent excuse me, permanently at uh, Wyan and Kennedy, which is a big advertising firm in Portland, Oregon right now. And a lot of people don't notice it. The title is called Wraith, and it's, it, which means a ghost or a ghost ship. 
So it's attached to the beams in the architecture with exactly the same paint color as the architecture. And it's about 30 feet off of the ground. So if you look for it, you can find it. And it's about, I think, four feet tall. So it's a pretty big ship. It was fun to make. I got really impatient with it, though. I was like, oh, I'm done with this ship. <laughs> um, these, this was a really fun series. Uh, it's called Guest, which is like a ghost or a revenant or a, a remnant of something, a reminder. And these were all antique sort of orphaned images that I was finding where on the backs of the images, um, because they had been put away in shoe boxes or in drawers for you know, several, several years, all of them are turn of the century images. And the images would transfer from the chemicals to the fronts, to the backs of the other images. So I was finding these ghosts on the backs of other photographs, which I thought was a really kind of interesting. And not all were done that way, but I just thought they were iconic, sort of, especially with the state of photography today, how everybody has Instagram. Everybody's taking amazing photographs. and this whole vocabulary of, of time and image is accessible. Like even through eBay, you can find amazing old antique photographs on eBay. And I thought, why well, try to recreate this image? Why don't I just look to see if it's already in the world? And then I, I actually go back and edit and make it the image that I wanted. Like I thought, I really want to do a howling wolf, but how am I going to find a howling wolf? So I found a orphaned turn of the century image and made it my own. And this one I thought was great because I thought it looked like Venus. Um, just the tilt of her head and you know the famous painting of Venus on the half shell. I just thought, wow, that looks just like her. So I named her Venus. But that was another ghost. And on and on. <laughs> and this guy was really creepy in the tree. Another ghost. And Tanta, that means ant in Dutch. And then speaking of the Dutch and sort of my, uh, my mother and my family, my heritage, I've always been really interested in light and um, just the Dutch master paintings and uh, sort of classic still life. So this, this series is actually called Still, S-T-I-L-L-E, and they're referencing sort of my contemporary version of still lives. Um, and this is one of my favorites, the hour between dog and wolf, because it's that time of day. It's an old French saying as well, where you may see a dog maybe in the distance, but it's that time of day where you're not sure if it's a dog or an actual wolf. So in it, and you can talk about in sense of people as well, not being able to distinguish who they are. Um, Wendy, I think we should okay, yeah, yes. move on. Yes, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, but, so uh, oh. yeah, I can stop here and, and pass on. So it, it kind of runs in that narrative. and. I love, I love all of that. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, uh, now, now that we've heard from, from uh, Wendy and, and Jimmy and Nina, and before we move on to, to Billy Joe, I wanted to um, say a little bit more about what brought us all together and, and this theme of, of signal to noise um, uh, that Jimmy alluded to in, in his presentation. And um, signal to noise is uh, an audio and an engineering and a science term. It, it has a few different applications, but it refers to the strength of a desired signal, um, what you want to hear, what you want to see, um, against the noise that's interfering with it. And so it's sort of about the relationship between, um, uh, or, or a way to look at it as, as a relationship between attention and distraction or a focus point and, and the distracting point. Um, and so we are all coming together and, and treating that in our different ways as a, uh, as a guiding metaphor of sorts to, um, and, and a, as, as a prompt to ask questions of, of uh, what and who is overpowering and, uh, and what is um, overpowered 
how do we know what to what to pay attention to and um, and and how do we sort of follow that signal? And it seems like a, a very appropriate and, and uh, topical uh, subject in the context of the environmental concerns that I, I think many of us on the tour share, but also um, with the the incredible noise that we all face with uh, with our technological connection. Um, uh, some of the, the uncertainty that we, we have faced in the last year uh, when, when considering different news sources and, and, and the conflicts between them. Um, we've heard a lot of people on the tour speaking about direct audio applications or, or uh, even when we were on the ferry we visited the bridge and they were talking about how they have uh, compass redundancies um, uh, and, and all of their compasses are set up to uh, overcome uh, electromagnetic noise from the ships um, and and so that's been very interesting and so uh, with that I'd like to, to pass it on to Billy Joe. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh here we go great. Um, here we are. As metaphorical expressions inspired by nature my work elicits possibilities of transformation and discovery. This piece, this first piece, was made in Grants, New Mexico, and it's about nine foot tall and seven feet at the bottom. And I got a permit uh, to get all the materials from the area uh, to make this piece. My hope with this piece and other natural work is that it creates an empathy uh, for the specific natural context of the area that it's in. And also with, with, with this work and other work that you'll see, uh, I'm interested in, in regards to the signal to noise theme and making work that just stops us or stops me or su surprises us, slows us down. I'm interested in the idea of a portal of just like walking into a new world. And to me, that's about taking away all the extra stuff and all the noise. Um, and actually sound is a really large part of my work. I, it drives, it's the number one information, uh, inspiration for my work. It, it fuels me constantly. It's my daily ritual, um, listening to music, listening to what's around me and incorporating, incorporating that within my installations. These these pieces, uh, some of them actually have soundtracks. Uh, I wasn't able to get some of that audio to you today, but if you check out my work more, you can find it. So uh, this work uh, was, it's at an art complex in Santa Fe called Meow Wolf. And um, this sculpture hangs upside down in a room. There's a speaker in each wall. And I worked with uh, over 40 musicians to create uh, kind of my own church or chapel to sit and listen. And uh, the, the most exciting part of it was uh, working with seniors in end-of-life care. The seniors read um, lyrics to songs, and so you might hear a senior say a short lyric like, tomorrow is spring, and then a song, an original song, plays after that. And the idea is just very simple. It's about sitting with music in space and uh, lines and light. My work is very much inspired by growing up in a Pentecostal Christian church, which was very, very intense. And while it was in many ways um, stressful, terrible, d dangerous, um, messed up my mind. At the same time, it uh, is just an incredible part of my life and my ritual. And uh, that, and combined with hospice, I worked in hospice for quite a few years. Those things um, really developed an interest for me in storytelling. Um, I'll get more to that a little later. Um, I often situate my work in publicly accessible locations not typically used for presenting art. By placing my work in and responding to specific environments, I open up my audience to a vivid consideration of a particular place. 
So this again is um, this concept of happening upon something uh, and really interested in work that's outside of a traditional gallery setting. And um, sanctuary, like spaces that can be used the way sanctuaries are used, but neutral and for everyone. This piece uh, I'm really excited about how the light all day, the light is changing how the piece, so the piece works as a sundial. And I, I definitely want to keep working in this vein. This part, this project was also part of a larger pro project called Stories of Route 66 International District. And we worked in Albuquerque's in International District for six months and uh, is the most diverse group of people I've ever been in a room with. Uh, we collaborated on art and placemaking and transforming different sites around the neighborhood. We were able to do three large scale things and one of them was the, the Morning Glory, which um, is now in co construction for a permanent uh, location in Albuquerque. He's really thrilled about that. And it's actually in the International District. So this community um, will have this piece. And I should get back to the community uh, we met during our visits. We developed together what a uh, public sculpture would be like. So the community drew ideas of their ideas of shelter and home and shapes that they like or and we looked at images together and developed models and then ultimately uh, this work happened big collaboration this is that group as well um, this is another in, in the realm of like the natural work and yeah, I, I want to, I also, I want to make things that are beyond me. I want to surprise myself, which is a really exciting. When you start a project, you have a sketch or a vision. And then when I'm making this piece as, I don't know, afterwards, I just was kind of, um, I was very much surprised. I didn't know what exactly was going to happen until I was finished and separate from it. And I want to continue to make work um, that I can learn from. And this residency is totally how I want to keep working because it's education. As we go, we're learning, we're inspiring each other. I'm like blown away by these artists getting very emotional daily, <laughs> hanging out with them, learning about them, at the same time experiencing this uh, Alaska <laughs> which I, I've never been, I cannot believe it. I will be back, um, very inspired. And uh, yeah, that's, that's. Miller, thank you very much. We've only got a little bit of time left. Um, just one quick question before we wrap up here. This is the second time the Island Institute has, has put this trip together, or a trip together like this. Is this officially an annual event now? Is this something you're going to keep on going with? I, uh, I, I'd, I'd like for it to be, and I, I think, I think <laughs> these guys will advocate for that. Um, yeah, yes. and, and, and so um, every, every year it will be a little bit dependent on funds. And, and this year we received funds from the National Endowment for the Arts and from the Alaska State Council on the Arts through the Rasmussen Foundation and from the McNamara Fund. And it's um, uh, so long as, as, as that sort of thing keeps happening, then, uh, then we can keep the Tideline's journey rocking. Okay. And have you checked in with last year's participants? Are they moving on to bigger and Yeah, um, yeah, there's been, there's been some great stuff going on with them. Allison Warden had a huge show last year um, in, uh, at the Anchorage Museum. Uh, Chantal Bilodeau had a showing shortly after our tour at Cyrano's Theater, and, and then she had a big residency in Europe, and, okay. and so she's working on her play. Um, and uh, yeah. Well, we've exhausted our time. Um, we've been hearing from artists Nina Elder, Billy Joe Miller, Wendy Gibbon, and Jimmy Reardon, and Peter Bradley of the Island Institute. I'm Jeremy Shea. Thanks for joining us on Forum at 360.
Funding for Forum App 360 comes from Rainbow Foods of Juneau.